So yes, guys. So let's start our session. First thing, importance of Indians. Why all of a sudden? Because when I qualified in 2011-2012, we heard about this concept of IFRS being embedded into our accounting standard, but we did not have Indians back then. But if you look at today, I think the entire CA final paper is only based on your Indians. Now, what made them come across with this particular change? Let me tell you. If you remember, you know, we, we study about economics and we talk about 91 reforms. 1991 Indian reforms on economy where there was a globalization and privatization which was encouraged, which was long overdue, but happened in 1991 under the regime of Manmohan Singh as a finance minister and Narasimha Rao as a prime minister. Now, that was a much wanted reform at that point of time. When we said we are open to global entities coming and establishing their enterprise and conducting businesses in India. Very good. We have recently got Facebook, Google, so many companies which are multinational companies incorporated outside India coming and performing businesses or doing businesses in India. You talk about motors other than Tata Motors, Ashok Leyland and Mahindra. I think all the motor companies, vehicles that we used on today's date have been an international companies. Now, when they come down to India, start performing their businesses in India, they have to make sure that they're reporting their financial statements according to India. So what used to happen was, let's say the entity of, uh, uh, let's say I'll take Toyota, a Japanese enterprise. A Japanese entity, Toyota, has come down and set up its business establishment in India, started manufacturing vehicles and making sure that basically they, they report their financial statements according to India. So what used to happen? The Indian entity of Toyota used to make sure that the financial statements are in compliance to our accounting standards which we had earlier, 1 to 29, right? We had accounting standard 1 to 29. Yes, 30, 31, 32 were given for a brief period of time, but later on, later withdrawn. But 1 to 29 standards, they have been complying. Make sure that they present a set of financial statements as an Indian entity. But the unfortunate part was the main parent entity with which the consolidation should occur is somewhere in Japan. Now, how do I consolidate an enterprise? which has been presented as per your accounting standard, consolidate with another enterprise in Japan, which is performing or which is preparing its financial statements in a complete different accounting principles. They had a complete different standard altogether. So it was so difficult. How can I even come across this kind of situation? So that is fundamentally the point which I wanted to drive. You need to understand that there should be a harmony. That means uniformity of accounting policies applied by the Indian enterprise and also by the Japanese enterprise so that the consolidation can occur. That is the first reason. Second reason. I happen to look at Reliance Industries. Okay, I have a fancy of reading your financial statements and I looked at Reliance Industries and I saw that their turnover, that is sales in number, was four and a half lakh crores. Crore is about seven, seven zeros, I guess, and lakh crores is about 12 or 13, 12 zeros, I guess. Imagine the number. Imagine the number. I looked at the number and I said, no enterprise in this world can ever come across or come up to this particular kind of a number. I was astonished. I was surprised. And if you frankly ask me, I was not feeling great. I was definitely not feeling great because I felt that is too much for someone to achieve. That is frankly what really happened. But the very next day, I hope everyone has this particular uh, app in their phone called as InShots. InShots keeps sending you certain, uh, you know, trivia or certain news which keeps on occurring. And there was one such InShot which was sent saying that Apple, the company Apple Inc. from the US had sufficient cash reserve, sufficient cash I'm talking about pure cash, cash reserve to purchase Reliance, Tata and Wipro put together. Reliance, Tata and Wipro put together, Apple could have acquired only with the help of their cash reserve. Imagine now, if I would have limited myself to understanding that Reliance is the biggest company which we come across, 
then this particular trivia which was sent saying that you apple has so much of cash reserve wouldn't have really made some sense that means comparability is important so until then comparability is only between two indian enterprise but when the globalization era has occurred now the comparability is between an indian enterprise and an enterprise which is operating outside india as well i'll have to increase the ambit of benchmarking i'll have to increase the ambit of comparison competitiveness because it's a global world there's no borders there's no barriers in this global world so that means for comparability you need to make sure that they are on the same metric if both are not on the same metric i'll tell you what happens i think most of us have at least 80 to 90 percent in our 10th let's say a student or you know your parents walk in and say you you were comfortably scoring 80s and 90s and 10th class why not the same 80 or 90 can happen in your cf final what will be your answer my answer would be a wild smile i'll wild smile and i'll say thank you for your amazing observation but definitely it is not possible so that means my comparability of my 10th marks and my comparability of ca final marks they don't have the same metric please don't compare both of them so that is fundamentally what I'm trying to talk. So therefore, I am here to say that basically for me to compare two enterprises which are in two different parts of the world, the first thing that they need to have is the same measurement, the same set of accounting policy, the same classification, the same reporting. Therefore, it was important for the entire globe to come on one page and adopt one single set of standards and such single set of standards which they have uh, which they have accepted globally is your ifrs international financial reporting standards now in that particular context or in making effort to adopt the ifrs ica has come up with basically setting up an accounting standards board and making sure that these ifrs are adopted into india by indianizing it what is indianizing it like let's say you have you know spicy paneer pizza spicy paneer pizza won't happen outside india it is an indian version of pizza that's it it's a pure indian version of pizza so there is nowhere else in the world if i go to us and i ask them where is spicy paneer pizza he'll look at me and he'll say from where did you even come from so you need to understand that they have indianized the same dish, right? Pizza is the same dish. It's a bun, it's baked, and just the toppings change. The same way, it's the same IFRS which I bought into India, made it a little more Indian because I wanted it to suit to my Indian enterprises, and I have released it again in the form of your IndiaS. So that is the reason why your IndiaS is called as a convergence with IFRS. It's called as convergence with IFRS. So this is fundamentally the requirement, the most important part of why IFRS has to be brought into picture. IFRS is, has, happens to be the most important aspect to be brought into picture at this point of time because we need global competition. We need global comparison. We need global benchmarking. We need to make sure that enterprises which are having a parent organization outside India have an ease in reporting in India. They should not be new to the reporting in India. So that is fundamentally the idea and we have bought in our IndiaS, which is a convergence of IFRS. Now, if you remember GST adoption, how it happened, 2017, they took one particular day, 1st July, and they said GST applicable, excise, service tax, VAT, every, CST, everything abolished. That is called as a blanket adoption. Blanket adoption means you identify one particular day and say that from this day, this particular act shall apply and the previous one shall not apply. But however, when it came to reporting, India was not in a position to do that. Number one, we need to look at whether the enterprises are ready or not. The readiness of the enterprise to adopt IFRS is the first thing. Second thing, do we have sufficient resources? That means sufficient people who have a knowledge on how, how IFRS should be adopted in India. This is the second most important thing that we need. Without these two, then there is no possibility of adoption of your India's or IFRS into India. Considering these two facts, the readiness of the enterprise to adopt 
and the resources available to adopt, India thought it is better for us to implement NDAs instead of a blanket manner in a phased wise manner. So first I will include certain amount of companies, subsequently I will include more companies and like that this goes on. In this process we have come across total four phases of adoption. We have come across four phases of adoption. What are the four phases of adoption that we come across? Now these phases of adoption have been given as per companies India's, India, companies India's rules 2015. That is companies accounting standard amendment rules 2015 which had an applicability starting from 1st April 2016 onwards. So this particular act which has been rolled out started with phase 1 and he said under phase 1 I will only try to include certain set companies which I feel the enterprises have sufficient resources and they are very much ready to adopt. These enterprises are listed and unlisted enterprises, be it listed, be it unlisted, I am not bothered. If they have a net worth of at least 500 crores, at least means greater than or equal to 500 crores. So any listed enterprise or an unlisted enterprise which has a net worth of at least 500 crores shall start adopting India's under the category of phase 1. What is your phase 1 category? According to the phase 1 category, the companies falling under this particular category should present their financial statements under India's for the financial year 2016-17. First financial year of 2016-17 you need to present India's financial statements. Unfortunately, if you remember, your financial statements according to your India's one presentation of financial statements should always be on comparative basis. So if I am presenting India's financial statements for 2016-17, that is the first year, then the comparative previous year is 2015-16. For the year 15-16, I was adopting or I presented the financial statements as per IGAP. The previous set of standards. For 2016-17, I am adopting India's. Now, how can these two be comparable to each other? So, you cannot compare the current year to the corresponding previous year. So, to overcome this, what he said was, though you are presenting your first India's financial statements for the year 2016-17, I would expect you to restate, I would expect you to restate the financial statements of the preceding financial year that is 15-16 to provide comparatives to the current year to provide comparatives to 2016-17 even your 15-16 has to be restated earlier I have already presented your financial, financial year 15-16 as per IGAP now has to be reworked revised as per NDS this effort is only to make sure that comparative information is available. So current year 16-17, previous year 15-16 should be reworked. But there should be one particular day on which the entire changes of India's, IGAP to India's have to be reworked upon. Because the measurement basis change, their classifications change, their recognitions change, there are so many changes. I cannot perform over the year because the enterprise is a going concern. It has been in operation since past. So on one particular day, I'll have to embed all the changes and make sure that henceforth I will start adopting India's. Now that one particular day is the beginning of the preceding year. The beginning of the immediately preceding year. First year for, two, uh, for phase 1 enterprises is 2016-17 for which India's has to be presented. The comparative previous year that is 2015-16 should be restated. So the first date of the previous year that is 1st April 2015 should be considered as a date on which I will completely transit from your previous IGAP into India's. This date 1st April 2015 is called as date of transition. On this particular date of 1st April 2015, which is the date of transition, we apply a particular standard called as India's 101. First time adoption of India's. There are certain things which are peculiar in that standard 
gives options to the enterprise, gives certain exemptions to the enterprise in transitioning into the NDS. Clear? So I am saying, according to the phase one, it covers enterprises whether listed or unlisted, having a net worth of 500 crores, net worth, not turnover. Turnover 500 crores, many companies will have, but net worth of 500 crores, that means I am indicating towards a very sizable company, a very, very sizable company. Such kind of companies have to adopt India's and present their financial statements as per India's for the first time for the financial year 1617. Since they are presenting the financial statements for the first time for the financial year 1617 and the financial statement should be presented on a comparative basis. So even the previous year 1516, which was earlier reported as per IGAP, has to be reworked, has to be revised as per the India's. To make sure that the transition happens, I will identify one date on which I will start adopting Indias 101, which is the first time adoption of Indias. And that date on which the transition occurs, that is the date of transition, is the beginning of the preceding year. That is in the phase one case, 1st April 2015. This is fundamentally how the implementation starts. Fundamentally, how implementation start. Guys, net worth more than at least 500 crores. I am talking about large enterprises which generally have best chartered accountants as their auditors or those auditors who have sufficient resources available to them. You talk about probably big force, they might have already worked on IFRS assignments or they have sufficient resources to IFRS. Therefore, it would be easier for them to basically adopt in days for them. Clear? That is the reason why I started phase one from there. They gave one year gap and they came back to phase two. Under phase two, they said, I will increase the ambit now because under phase one, not even 0.01% of the companies, total companies have come into the ambit of Indies because you're not just talking about listed or unlisted enterprises. You put a restriction of at least 500 crores of net worth. We are not even 0.1% of companies. Then came in the second part. This is a significant step. The phase two included all listed enterprises. All listed enterprises irrespective of their turnover, irrespective of their turnover, irrespective of their net worth, any listed enterprise shall be adopting India's starting from the financial year 2017-18. Now that is a significant change. What about unlisted entities then? Any unlisted enterprise which has a net worth of at least 250 crores. Listed enterprises, no restriction on net worth. Some listed enterprises have negative net worth also because they might have incurred losses in the past in such a way that the entire reserves and surplus became negative. So your even the net worth also can become negative. So therefore such kind of enterprises, even if they have a negative net worth, if they have their equity or debt securities listed under stock exchanges, then they should be covered under phase two. If equity or debt securities are not listed, then such unlisted enterprise should have at least a net worth of 250 crores. They shall form part of my phase two category. Under my phase two category, I will apply in days starting for the financial year 2017-18 onwards. If my first India's financial statements are presented for 2017-18, then the comparative previous year should be 16-17. 16-17, which was already presented as per IGAP, should be reworked upon. And the date of transition on which we will apply India's 101 is your 1st April 2016. Now, after I cover phase 1 and phase 2, I come up with one simple understanding of that the net worth word has become very important because your entire applicability is revolving around this word net worth. So what is net worth and what should be included in net worth we will start covering in the next slide but keep that word aside because I will have to explain you what net worth is here. Then I have phase three and phase four. Phase 3 and Phase 4 is only for banks, NBFCs and insurance companies. There is no other entity which will be included in this. It's only banks, NBFCs, it is NBFC guys, 
not NGFC, I'm sorry for the typo, and insurance companies. Guys, when I talk about banks, NBFCs, and insurance companies, they could either be, uh, you know, uh, they could either be uh, uh, having a net worth of at least they could either be listed or unlisted. I'm not talking about listing category here. My category of including them under phase three and phase four is particularly based on their net worth. Net worth at least 500 crores. I will cover them under phase three. Net worth at least 250 crores. Then I'll cover them under phase four. Phase three, my first India's financial statement should be prepared for the year 1819. Comparative previous year is 1718. Date of transition is 2000, 1st April 2017, on which I will apply the provisions of India's 101. Phase 4 Banks, NBFCs, and insurance companies having a net worth of at least 250 crores. Then the 1st April 2000, sorry, my uh, finan first financial statements to be prepared under India's is for the financial year 1920. Perfectly a COVID year starting. Right, exactly are towards the end of 1920 was your COVID, uh, the entire havoc created by COVID. So 1920 was the first financial statements to be drafted as per NDS. Comparative previous year is 1819 and my date of transition on which I will apply the provisions of NDS 101 is your 1st April 2018. Question comes up. What is net worth first of all? Should the net worth be calculated as per IGAP or net worth as per NDS? These are very important questions. Let's look at them. Net worth, net worth, net worth. What is net worth? Net worth is paid up share capital plus securities premium plus any reserve created out of profit. Paid up share capital plus securities premium plus any reserve created out of profit. What are reserves created out of profits? Generally, you can have general reserve, p and &L. So all these are retained earnings. These are generally reserves created out of profits. I earn certain profit. I appropriate them into a particular reserve. Remember guys, when I say re reserves created out of profits, revaluation reserve is never created out of profits. It is created by increasing or upward revaluing your land clear or any other asset. So therefore it should particularly exclude revaluation reserve. It is not a reserve created out of profit. However, these additions paid up share capital, securities premium and reserves created out of profits should be reduced by that means deducted by accumulated losses, which is a p and shown in debit balance habits. A lot of companies which have a PL with debit balance. Miscellaneous expenses not written off. Underwriting commission, preliminary expenses, amalgamation adjustment account. All these are miscellaneous expenses which should be written off to PL. But according to our principles, we will write them off over the years. Therefore, the to the extent they are not written off also should be reduced in computation of network. Paid up share capital plus securities premium, plus reserves created out of profits, reduced by accumulated losses p and shown in debit balance and your miscellaneous expenses not written off. This net worth should be calculated based on IGAP financials because you will not know what is India's net worth unless and until you apply India's. I am not applying India's. I am seeing whether the enterprise should apply India's or not. When I'm assessing this, the financial statements which are presented to me is purely IGAP financials. So in my IGAP financials, if the net worth presented is calculated according to this formula, if it exceeds that 500 crores or 250 crore criteria, then I'll apply India's net worth should be calculated based on the most recent annual audited financial statements after the date of or before the date of India's adoption guys. Please make sure that there is a correction. It is before the date of adopting India's most recent annual financial statements before adopting the India's whatever is the net worth that should be considered for the computation of your categories under phase one or phase two. Clear?
Remember, guys, for the first enterprise, phase one, the immediate preceding year before the India's adoption was 1560. However, he says net worth computation should be made on 31st of March 2014 or afterwards. That means based on your IGAP financials prepared or drafted up to 31st March 2014 or later if the enterprise has exceeded the threshold limit of 500 or 250 crores then India shall apply. Net worth should be computed as on 31st March 2014 or at a later date. If you look at phase 2 all listed enterprises are covered. All listed enterprises means one where either the debt securities or equity securities are listed on stock exchange which is recognized by SEBI. But here they say that certain entities which were particularly listed on small and medium exchange SME index as they call it, they are excluded from application of India's any enterprise which is listed on an SME index, small and medium enterprise index should be excluded from adopting India's if they fall under the phase 2 category. Clear? If an enterprise falls under the implementation of India's or adoption of India's in their financial statements, then the group company, the group companies to which this company is a part of should also adopt India's. My subsidiary is adopting India's. The holding company cannot present under IGAP because they have to present on a consolidated basis. If the subsidiary is adopting India's, then the holding company has to adopt India's. Otherwise, consolidation is not proper or is not possible. Same way, if the holding enterprise is, prefer, is preparing India's or preparing financial statements as per India's, then automatically my subsidiaries, my associates, my joint ventures or even my holding company should adopt India's. I'll put it like this. If an enterprise adopts India's, then all enterprises where this enterprise is a part of the group companies should also adopt India's. If an enterprise is adopting India's, then all enterprises in that same group, that means holding, their subsidiaries, joint ventures, and associates should also adopt India's. This is to ensure your consolidation. To ensure that the consolidation occurs, this is very very important here. And that will bring us to the end of the discussion on roadmap for India's or the adoption of India's or transition into India's. This is the first transition into India's which started with phase 1 enterprises presenting India's financial statements for the year 2016-17. We are still going on and we have completed the phase 4 right now where we had adoption of phase 4 banks, NBFCs and insurance companies who, which had a net worth of at least 250 crores. Now phase 5 should start but COVID you know it will get delayed but definitely they will have a phase 5 and subsequent adoptions as well. Clear?
Yes, guys. So let's start out. We will start with the concepts of asset related standards which deal with India 16, 38 and 40. These are three fixed asset related standards which earlier was covered under the standard of AS10 and AS26. So these were the two standards which we had earlier called as tangible assets and intangible asset. Now have got revised. Now you have under India three standards. 16 talking about property plan and equipment, 38 talking about intangible asset, 40 talking about investment property. A question will come, sir, why not 16 separate, 38 separate, 40 separate? Reason is very simple. Your recognition and measurement uh, as per these three standards are more or less similar. They are more or less similar. So wherever there is a difference, I'll give you the difference. But let me tell you, that these standards are primarily very similar in nature as far as the recognition and measurement is concerned. I know they talk about complete different things. They have a significant difference as far as the definition is concerned. But the crux of the standard in recognition and measurement is significantly same. That is the reason why I combined these three standards. So let's see. Let us start first with the definitions part. Regarding the definition, when I look at AS 16 definition regarding your property, plant and equipment, he says these are assets which are tangible. Tangible means which you can touch, feel, see. Those are called as tangible assets. They are held for three purposes which are given as per the standard. Use in the process of production or for provision of services. Use for rental to others and for administrative purposes. If a property, plant and equipment is a tangible asset, then it should be held for either of these three purposes. Number one, use in the process of production or for providing a service. Number two, for rental for rental uh, uh, to others. That means I'm offering it on rent to someone else or for administrative purpose. And they're expected to be used by the enterprise for more than one financial year. If the life of the asset is for more than one financial year, then you can call them or you can classify them under the head of India's 16. It is a tangible asset held for the purpose of, uh, held for the process of production or for provision of services or for rental to others or for administrative purposes. While it comes to intangible definition, they kept it very simple. I'll tell you why they kept it very simple. It is an identifiable non-monetary asset without physical substance. It is an identifiable non-monetary asset without physical substance. That's it. Full stop. Over. Story. Khatam. We have significant different definition which was earlier given under AS26. Because according to AS26, I'm talking about the previous accounting standard which is not applicable for you. But I'm just giving you a reference to that. An extract of AS26 dealing with definition of intangible assets would go like this. It is an identifiable non-monetary asset without physical substance held for use in the process of production or provision of services used for rental to others, used for administration purpose. The purposes for which the intangible asset can be used have been specifically given under the standard AS26. However, when we came down to India S38, he stopped it. He did not have those purposes. He simply said it is non-monetary asset without physical substance. Question will come. Why? Logic simple. Underwriting commission. Miscellaneous expenses not written off. Is there any particular standard regarding that? Is there any particular standard which was talking about preliminary expenses? You never had a standard regarding them. But these items were very much there in your financial statements for which no standard was applicable. So what he started doing now was, I will try to include them or embed them into India's 30. So that I will try to give an amortization for even such kind of expenses as per India's 38. That is the idea. That is why he said India's 38 stops the definition by identifiable non-monetary asset without physical substance. 
identifiability is a very very important aspect that we will have to discuss further what do you mean by identify what is a monetary and non monetary asset monetary asset means anything which can be collected in cash debtors bank balances bills receivable all these can be collected uh, advances all these can be collected in cash they are called as monetary assets those assets which are not collected in cash are called as non monetary assets and there is no physical substance then they will be covered under intangible asset what about investment property then this is particularly a new standard there is no comparative previous accounting standard which was which was there under igap what is this standard talking about this standard is talking about property what kind of property a property either held in the form of a land or a building or a part of a building or a combination of both land and building guys if i say building then there is a land which is attached to it okay there is no separate building as such there is always some part of land which is attached to it so a property which is held as land building or a combination of both either by the owner that means i own that particular piece of land or i have acquired that piece of land on lease i have acquired that piece of land on lease in such cases if i hold them and for what purpose do i hold them number 1 i am expecting capital appreciation on the property today i buy it for 100 i am expecting that this prices of real estate will go up and i would be able to dispose it off at 1500 or 1600 in 3 years time that is capital appreciation number 2 or to derive lease rentals from operating lease or my intention is to derive lease rentals from operating lease and lastly both that means i want to derive lease rentals initially but subsequently whenever i get a capital profit or capital appreciation i will dispose it so what am i saying an investment property is a property held as land building or a combination of both by whom either i own it or i acquired it on finance lease for what purpose am i holding those land and building either to have capital appreciation or to derive lease rentals from operating lease or a combination of both to derive lease rentals and also for capital appreciation these kind of assets shall be categorized separately as investment property question comes up why sir why why earlier it was covered under property plan and equipment now also you put it there only no why separate standard i'll tell you this is a very important ratio if you remember return on fixed assets remember return on fixed assets which is operating profit divided by operating asset but when i talk about assets which are held for the purpose of capital appreciation or deriving rental income they are not operating assets they are definitely not operating assets therefore when i take the ratio of operating profits to assets then in such cases i'll have to leave out this assets which are categorized as india s 40 investment property and i will calculate my return on fixed assets only on india s 16 assets and india s 38 assets i will not include india s 40 assets they have a different perspective the objective of the enterprise is different and the purpose for which i hold them is different therefore they have to be recognized measured and also presented separately they should be recognized separately measured separately and presented separately they do not have a similar characteristics of an asset under india 16 and india 38 india 16 and 38 are held for the purpose of operations of the business to make sure that the business is conduct clear i'll first start the recognition criteria guys look at the recognition criteria according to india 16 i will recognize a property plant and equipment if the future economic benefits 
from the use of the asset is probable to arise. I'm saying future economic benefits are probable to arise from the use of the asset. Now, if I look at the very important term here is future economic benefits. What do you mean by future economic benefit? Economic benefit could be increase in sales, decrease in cost, or ease and efficiency of use. Either my sale increased, cost reduced, or my use has become more effective or efficient, or has become very easy. Either of these things can be called as economic benefit. He never said economic benefit shall arise from use. That's a different statement. Here he said is probable to arise. The word probable is very important. I have given my exam. I am probable to pass. Whether I will pass or not, I will get to know only when the result is declared. On the day of the result, I can pass. I can also not pass. That's what let us pass. But still, that is called as probable. That means it is expected. I have written my exam very well. So I expect to pass. Certain? 100% sure? No, no, I'm not 100% sure. I'm saying it probable to pass. That means what? When I say probability of future economic benefits, then I'm saying I expect economic benefits to arise. But I don't know when I will get the benefit, how much benefit I will derive, I may not be able to tell you. When? That is the timing. How much? That is the quantity of benefit is unknown. I cannot quantify. I cannot quantify that this much benefit I will get on this year. It is not possible for me to measure with certainty. That is why he uses the word future economic benefits are probable to arise. First part. Second recognition criteria. The asset is within the control of the enterprise. When do you say asset is within the control of enterprise? If an enterprise has a right to grant access and has a right to restrict taxes. If I want, I can give you the access. If I don't want, I can restrict the access. This particular video that you're watching, I have granted you access to watch this video. That means I control this content. I control this content or the particular service provider controls the content if he can grant access or restrict access to a particular asset. My vehicle is my fixed asset. If I want to give it, then I will hand over the keys to someone. If I don't want to give it, I'll put the keys in back into my pocket. I exercise control. My house is my property, plan and equipment. I will lock the house and I'll go away. That is restricting access to someone unauthorized. If I want someone to go into my house, I'll give him the keys or hand him over the keys. I have granted access. So for me to establish control, the enterprise should have the ability to grant access and restrict access to its asset. Clear? Third one, the cost of the asset can be measured reliably. If the cost cannot be measured reliably, you can never identify the asset or recognize an asset. I don't know what is the cost, then you cannot recognize a particular asset. Because for us, money measurement is a very, very important aspect of accounting. If you cannot recognize it, if you cannot measure it, you cannot recognize it. Clear? If you look at the recognition criteria of India S38, it is more or less similar except for one simple addition. That is the concept of identifiability. If you remember, even when I was lock, looking at the definition, I told you it is an identifiable non-monetary asset without physical substance. What do you mean by identifiability? That is the first thing. But if you look at India's 40 recognition criteria, perfectly the same as India's 16. There is no difference as far as the recognition criteria is concerned. It will still stick to those three. Future economic benefits are probable to arise. The asset is within the control of the enterprise and the cost of the asset can be measured reliably. The only one addition which I have under India's 38 is identifiable. 
Now, why is it so important that under India's 38 regarding intangible asset, he included this part of identifiability? Logic very simple. Intangible asset does not have a physical substance. If I ask you to show where is your watch, I'll show it. If I'll ask you to show where is the intangible asset that is a skill that you gain from this particular lecture, show. Show where is it? You chop off your head and then you then also I can't see. The skill which you have gained is your intangible asset. That intangible asset here should be identifiable. If you cannot identify, you cannot recognize. If you cannot identify, you cannot recognize. What do you mean by identification? I say, for us to identify it, identifiability is the only difference between India 16 and India 38. Look at what identifiability is. Identifiability is something related to separability. When do you say separability? Separability means that intangible asset has been acquired separately through a legal right. I purchased a tally software for three years by paying 54,000. I paid 54,000 to acquire the tally license. That is called as a separate legal right. Clear? First one. Second one. Even though I did not buy it separately, but it is capable of being separated sold, transferred, licensed, rented or exchanged. I did not buy it separately. It came along with a particular asset. Let's say for example, he said, you buy the laptop, I will give you Windows or Microsoft Office 365 license free of cost. You buy a laptop, I give you Microsoft Office 365 free of cost. I will still call it as separable if the Microsoft Office 365 license, it can be separated. That means I already own a license. Why do I need this license? This license, I can separate it from the asset that is a laptop which I bought. I can sell it or I can transfer it. I can license it to someone else or I can rent it or exchange it. Then you can say that the intangible asset is identifiable because it can be separated. So I'm saying identifiability means it is separability. If I have acquired a separate, if I have acquired an intangible asset through separate legal rights, number two, it is capable of being separated, sold, transferred, licensed, exchanged or rented. Clear? Sometimes it may not be separable. It may not be possible to separate the intangible asset and tangible asset. Tell me examples. I purchased a PlayStation CD. I think guys can relate to this. 3000 rupees FIFA game CD which I purchased from Amazon. The CD which was delivered to me was in the form of a physical tangible asset. But what is the purchase which I have done? I did not buy the CD. I bought the contents of the CD. What is the content of the CD? The game. I purchased an Air Rahman CD otherwise. Let's take an easier case. Air Rahman classical hits 999 rupees. I bought it. Now the CD is of a physical substance, but the contents of the CD are intangible in nature. I purchased a mobile phone which was Android and Android OS came along with it. Then in such cases, can I separate the mobile phone and the OS and still use it? Not possible. Can I separate them and license it, exchange it, rent it, transfer it? Is it possible? No, not possible yet. If you remove the Android software from that particular mobile phone, neither the mobile will work nor the software shall work. Therefore, it is inseparable. If it is inseparable, then in such case, classify based on predominant nature. The music CD of AR Rahman hits which I bought, empty CD 10 rupees. Why did I pay 999 rupees? Because of the contents of that CD. The content of the CD is the predominant nature of that purchase. Therefore, such song CD even has a tangible portion of the CD 
it is insignificant. Since it is insignificant, the more significant or predominant nature is the contents of the CD. Therefore, it should be classified under index 38 as an intangible asset. If the tangible component is predominant, then I will classify it as index 16. Guys, it should be yes and no. If tangible component is predominant, yes, classify under index 16. If your answer is no, then classify under index 38. Clear? Very clear there. So we have completed the recognition criteria where I am saying I will recognize an asset under index 16 only if it satisfies three criteria. First one. Future economic benefits are probable to arise. The word probable is very important. Probable means I do not know what is the quantity of benefit and what is the timing of the benefit. The asset is within the control of the enterprise. Cost of the asset can be measured reliably. The same three recognition criteria are applicable even for India's 38 intangible asset and India's 40 investment property. However, regarding index 38, since it is a non-monetary asset without a physical substance, an additional recognition criteria should be met, which is regarding identifiability. According to identifiability, he says, it is an, 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 an intangible asset is identifiable if it can be separable. What do you mean by separable? It is acquired through a separate legal right or it is capable of being separated, sold, transferred, exchanged, licensed, and rented. If it is inseparable, that means you cannot separate the tangible and intangible parts, then in such case classify based on predominant nature. Tangible part is more predominant, India's 16 property plan and equipment. Intangible part is more predominant than India's 38. This is the aspect of recognition and measurement, guys. I'll come back to this concept. There is a difference between India's 16 and India's 40. There's always a difference. India's 16 talks about property, plant and equipment. It also talks about providing on rental to others. Right? Three purposes, right? What are the three purposes? It is for the use in the process of production, provision of services, rental to others. Rental to others is also that if a property, plant and equipment is available for rental to others, the same concept of India's 40 is also getting triggered because India's 40 investment property is also held for capital appreciation or to derive lease rental and operating lease. There is a conflict. If I have a building, then where should I classify it? I'll tell you. A building, if it is occupied by the enterprise themselves, I have occupied it myself for the purpose of, um, let's say, my office premises. It shall be classified as India 16 property plan and equipment. Due to increase in the size of my workforce, my building in which I own and why, where I operate is no longer sufficient. So I shifted from this business premises to another business premises. But this business premises which I own, which I left, what do I do with that? So I started leasing it out to someone else. I gave it on operating lease and started deriving lease rental every month. Then that asset, that building, which was until then used for my office purposes was classified as India 16. Now, once I have moved out of the premises and have given out that premise on rent, then I will have to now classify it under India's 40 as investment property. Here, yeah. so you need to understand the concept of India's 40 and the distinguishment with India's 16. Any other asset other than land and building, which is given on rent, should always be considered as India's 16. Because India's 40 is only limited to land or a building or a combination of both. That is why we come across this situation of India's 16 versus India's 40. If a property is held for more than one purpose, that means I have a building 
first floor i occupied second floor i gave it on lease then in such situation that building is basically used for more than one purpose then you have to see whether i can separate it or not how do i know whether it is separable or not it can the property can be considered as separable if the property can be sold or let out under finance lease separately that means i can lease out one floor while keep occupying one floor then you can say that if it can be sold separately or leased out separately then to the extent of owner occupied premises where i am using it for my own office i will classify it as india 16 property plan and equipment to the extent it has been sent out or it has been leased out on operating lease to derive lease rentals i will classify that part as investment property however if it cannot be separate if it cannot be separate i am running a co-working space okay i'm running a co-working space i occupied one chair all rest of the chairs have been leased out can you separate not separable in such case which is more significant if leased out space is more significant classify it as india s40 if owner occupied space is more significant then i will classify it as india s16 here this happens to be a situation where an asset has been used for more than one single purpose sometimes happens that i provide ancillary services what is ancillary services co-working space i provided you space furniture plug and play direct you can come down put your laptop all services are provided office boy is there reception is there conference room is there cafeteria is there everything provided along with that particular seat in such case in such case if i am providing such kind of services those are ancillary services i'm providing you washrooms i am providing you housekeeping i am providing you a clerk i am providing you reception i am providing you ca your cafeteria facilities conference room facilities air conditioning everything being provided so these are ancillary services provided along with the lease of that space correct if the ancillary services are significant when do you say they are significant I will call them as significant if they can influence the price at which the property is let out. Each seat, each seat in a co-working space costs between 8 to 10,000 rupees. Each seat is costing me 8 to 10,000 rupees which is significantly high. No one will charge you 8 to 10,000 rupees without all these facilities. Furniture, furniture, your air conditioning, beautiful premises cafeteria all facilities provided that's why it is that pricey so ancillary services provided with the property rent have significantly affected that particular property so let out the lease rental is significantly influenced by ancillary services therefore it should be classified as india 16 not as india 40 because it is not just a lease it is a lease with ancillary services being provided However, if ancillary services are insignificant, I have a flat which I have let, I have leased it out. While giving the flat on rent, I told the own, uh, tenant that watchman will be there, water facility is there, electricity facility is there, and those are things which are always there. If those facilities are not provided, I won't even take your property on lease. So therefore, the ancillary services provided along with the rent of your flat is insignificant it does not influence the price at which the flat has been let out therefore since it ancillary service is insignificant i'll classify it as investment property under india spot these are the two situations where ancillary services and properties held for more than one purpose are having a distinction or a di diverse classification between india 16 and india 40 and that will bring us to the end of discussion on recognition of your India 16, India 38 and India 40. Yeah.
Yes, guys. So let's bring in recognition and measurement now. Guys, when I start about recognition and measurement, you need to understand that except for India's 40, the recognition and measurement is significantly similar in other two topics. Under India 16 and 38, it is very similar. Look at India 16 and 38. Initial recognition and subsequent recognition, if I talk about my initial recognition of India 16 and 38 should always be on the date of acquisition at cost. There is no moving away from cost. Even for India 40 also, if I look at the initial recognition on the date of acquiring that particular asset, it should always be at cost. However, the difference between India 16, 38 and 40 appears under subsequent recognition. On each balance sheet date, when I subsequently recognize an asset, then for India 16 and 38, I can either adopt a cost approach or I can adopt a revaluation approach. What is your cost approach? Cost approach basically means the original cost reduced by accumulated depreciation to get the written down value to be presented in your financial statements, which we are very much aware of. Then what is this revaluation approach? Revaluation approach means where I will start making sure that the assets should be measured at their fair value. I will make sure that the assets are measured at their fair value. So to identify the value of an asset, let's say a particular vehicle. On 1st April 2020, the vehicle value was 100. On 31st March 2021, towards the end of the year, it was 95. I will charge 5 rupees as depreciation and 95 rupees will become the written down value of the asset under revaluation model. Can't there be upward revaluation? There can always be upward revaluation also. I took the easier example of downward revaluation. We will see what will happen in the case of upward and downward revaluation at the later part. What about India's 40? According to India's 40, my subsequent recognition on balance sheet date should only be as per cost model. We cannot have another revaluation model as far as India's 40 is concerned. Clear? That means your investment property on a subsequent date of balance sheet date should always be measured on cost approach. You cannot apply revaluation approach, which is possible in the case of India 16 as well as India 38. Clear? This is regarding your recognition. Now, first thing when I say initial measurement should be at cost on the date of acquisition. How do I identify the initial cost? That should be the concept. Let's see. Initial measurement when I have a separate acquisition, that means I acquired this uh, asset separately. Then in the case of such kind of acquisition, cost to be included for recognizing an asset should be cost of purchase of the asset minus the trade discount, all other direct costs incurred to bring the asset to its current location and condition in which the management intends to use this. Let's say I purchased the air conditioner. The air conditioner was purchased at a price of 25,000. Air conditioner got delivered into the house. He said delivery charges 500 rupees. I paid him 25,000. I paid for the air conditioner. 500 rupees I paid for the delivery. Now the air conditioner is in my premises. So what is the total cost? 25,500. Is it sufficient? No. That air conditioner has to be mounted onto a particular wall and on that wall I'll have to make sure that the uh, it is connected to the electricity so there is a significant installation cost so I I bought in one more person who has installed that particular asset who has installed that AC onto a particular place and he gave me the remote and he said sir switch on the AC now it is now it is working I said yes it is working he charged me 1500 rupees as installation charge even such installation cost should also be included in the cost of the asset. Therefore, cost of purchase plus the delivery charges that is cost incurred to bring the asset to the current location and to install it, that is to bring it in a particular condition in which I intend to use it. All such costs should be included in the cost of asset. 
apart from this an additional cost should be included is called as estimated cost of dismantling removal and site restoration now what am i saying this air conditioner has a useful life of five years after five years i will have to dismantle the asset and have to sell it as scrap the cost of dismantling the asset that is removing the asset from there and putting it down will cost 2000 rupees at the end of fifth year guys 2000 rupees at the end of year 5 what is the discounted present value now that is called as estimated cost of dismantling removal and site restoration discounted to its present value should be included into the cost now itself this part this part last part that is the present value of estimated future cost of dismantling removal and site restoration is called as a constructive obligation this concept of constructive obligation appears under india 37 what is constructive obligation the obligation for removing the air conditioner i have got the obligation when i installed the ac when i installed the ac i had taken up a liability to dismantle it at a later point of time these are called as constructive obligations these constructive obligation for present value of estimated future dismantling cost should also be included and they have to be depreciated over the useful life of this that means instead of charging it to PNL in the year in which i incurred the dismantling cost i am including it on cost today and I'm charging depreciation over the useful life of this. This are these are the three inclusions in the cost of the asset when you have acquired the asset separately. Cost of purchase, other direct cost to bring the asset to the current location and condition in which the management intends to use the asset. Third one, present value of future cost of dismantling the asset, removing the asset, and restoration of the site. Second time, where multiple assets are acquired in a single transaction. I acquired the asset separately, but it was not one single asset. There are three or four assets put together which I acquired by paying one simple price. Slump sale, you know, this is slump purchase. That means not one asset, group of assets put together are bought. In such cases, I will have to allocate the purchase price to each asset acquired in the proportion of their fair value. I will have to allocate the purchase price to each asset acquired in the proportion of their fair value provided, provided sum of all fair values of the asset acquired is less than the purchase price. A, B, C, D, four assets together were purchased. A's cost was 40, B's cost was 30, C's cost was 20, D's cost was 10. Fair values. I acquired it by paying 80 rupees. What is the sum of fair values? A 40 plus B 30, 70 plus C 20, 90 plus D 10, 100. Sum of fair values of the asset is greater than the transaction price or purchase price of 80 in such case 80 will be allocated to a b c d in the ratio of 4 is to 3 is to 2 is to 1 but if my purchase price is not 80 and instead it is 105 then what should i do then recognize a b c d not in the proportion of fair values but it should be recognized at fair value. A should be recognized at 40, B should be recognized at 30, C should be recognized at 20, and D should be recognized at 10. Sir, but I paid 105, 5 rupees extra I paid. That 5 rupees excess payment should be recognized as goodwill. Because your purchase price is more than the sum of fair value of the assets acquired. Clear? This is the concept of multiple assets being acquired in a single transaction when i acquire multiple assets in single transaction then the purchase price should be allocated to each asset 
in the ratio of their fair value provided the sum of fair values is greater than the purchase price if the transaction price or purchase price is more than sum of fair value then the difference between the sum of fair value and the transaction price should be recognized as goodwill and each asset uh, acquired should be recognized at their fair value clear what about self constructed asset i made my own asset let's say for example i was supposed to construct a building so what i did instead of buying a building as such i purchased building material like cement sand concrete steel separately i engaged labor and i made sure that the construction is complete this is what normally everyone does this is called as self constructed asset i did not buy the building as such but i constructed the asset myself in such cases all cost incurred to bring the uh, asset to the location and condition in which the management intends to use it should be included in the cost of this so that means cost of material like sand cement steel metal purchase plus cost of labor that is wages paid to those workers everything included should be the cost incurred by the management to bring the asset to its location and condition in which the management intends to use that particular asset however whenever i have such kind of self constructed asset i should do a testing the testing means commissioning that means i let's say machinery was made i purchased metal i assembled the metal in such a way that there is a machinery which is produced i put in some raw material and i got the output output is my desired output the way i want to see the output then i will say testing is successful then even the testing cost should be included in the cost of the asset but if the testing is failed i put in some raw material i got an output that but this output is not the desired output that means my commissioning or testing failed in such cases the cost of the failed testing should not be included in the cost of the asset clear only successful testing cost should be included in the cost of the asset failed testing cost should be charged to pnl clear what about exchange of assets i purchased this asset with the help of exchanging already owned asset i already own a particular asset i gave up that asset and i acquired a new asset in such cases the asset acquired should always be measured at either the fair value of the asset acquired or the fair value of the asset given up whichever is more clearly evident i'll have to recognize the asset acquired at the fair value of the asset given up or the fair value of the asset acquired whichever is more clearly evident how do you know which is more clearly evident generally generally i'm talking about the asset acquired is more clearly evident let's say i purchased a new car by giving up my old car new car price is 15 lakhs i went to maruti true value or cars 24 and i asked him to take off this car as an exchange said sir for this car i can give you 2 lakh rupees i purchased a new car by paying 10 lakhs but out of which 2 lakhs was reduced so there is an exchange of asset which fair value is more clear the new car fair value is more clear the old car fair value is not reliable only because if i exchange it he'll give me 2 and 1/2 lakh if i would have sold it i would have only got 2 lakhs if i would have given it to my friend or my brother then i would have charged even less so fair value becomes very subjective that is the reason why he said whichever is more clearly evident however the asset acquired by exchange of another asset should not be measured at fair value in two situations number 1 the transaction lacks commercial nature my friend liked my phone he gave me his phone and took my phone he swapped the sim exchange of asset does it have a commercial transaction 
Absolutely no. Such kind of transactions which lack commercial nature should not be recognized at all. That is the first exception. Second one. I don't know the fair value of the asset acquired. Neither I know the fair value of the asset given. Both I don't know. I gave up one asset. I acquired another asset. I don't know what is the fair value of the asset which I acquired. Neither I know the fair value of the asset which I gave. In such cases, if the fair value of either the asset given up or the asset acquired cannot be identified reliably, then you cannot measure them at fair value. In such cases, I will measure them at the carrying value of asset given up. Asset given up is my own asset. It is already existing in my books of accounts. So the carrying value of the asset given up should be considered as the value at which I will recognize the asset acquired. This is only possible in cases where the fair value cannot be measured reliably. Next one, measurement through government grant. If there is a government grant which is received against which I acquired this, I purchased a recycling plant. Government has given me a grant of 2 lakhs against the asset of 10 lakhs. To set up an industrial unit, government has given me land at a price of just 50,000 rupees. These are acquisition through government grant. Whenever I acquire through government grant, then I can have two different types of treatment as given under India S20. According to India S20, two types of treatment. Number one, measure the asset at fair value and the government grant received should be credited to an account called as deferred government grant account. I received a land worth 1 crore rupees just by paying 1 lakh as grant. So I will record land account debit 1 crore to bank 1 lakh to deferred government grant 99 lakhs. This deferred government grant should be credited to PNL over the useful life of the asset, over the period for which the conditions attached to the grant are expected to be satisfied. Clear? Or alternative treatment suggested by India 20 is recognize the land only at 1 lakh. Reduce the government grant from the cost of the asset. 10 lakhs asset, 2 lakh grant, recognize the asset only at 8 lakhs. This way I can recognize it as per India's 20. This is regarding acquisition of an asset from government grant. Two new aspects which will come under India's 38 and one new aspect which comes under India's 40. What are these aspects? Under India's 38, there is an acquisition through business combination. What is this? I acquired intangible assets on I I acquired tangible along with intangible asset on business combination. I am a acquirer. He is the transferer. The transferer recognized a particular intangible asset. I will recognize as an acquirer that intangible asset in my books of accounts after the business combination only if the recognition criteria is met in my books. Let's say recognition criteria is not met in your booksman. It was an intangible asset recognized by the transferor but the acquirer recognition criteria not met. What will happen? I won't recognize the asset. What happens in that case? Goodwill arising on business combination will increase. How? Because goodwill is equal to purchase consideration minus fair value of assets and liabilities recognized. Automatically the fair value of the assets and liabilities will come down because one such asset is not recognized. Therefore, automatically the value of goodwill arising on business combination as per India's 103 increases. Contra using what if the intangible asset was not recognized by the transferor, but it met the recognition criteria in the books of transfer, in the books of acquirer, I recognize the asset. Automatically goodwill will fall or come down. Clear? 
regarding intangible asset there are a very important concepts relating to internally generated intangible asset what is this concept of internally generated intangible asset let's say for example the enterprise was earlier following tally here tally software size of the business grew i adopted sap now so my existing staff has to be trained on sap so i gave them sap training my sap training cost was 50 lakhs my sap training cost was 50 lakhs to my employees can i recognize the training cost as an intangible asset think about it future economic benefit is probable yes how first of all is it an identifiable asset yes what did you develop skill of my employee future economic benefit is probable yes can you control the asset what is the asset skill of the employee how will you control will you tie the employee to the chair and you say that you are not supposed to move because i trained you not possible so that means a skill of an employee which the employer or which the enterprise cannot monitor or cannot exercise control you cannot recognize them as intangible asset i'll give you one more example let's say every student who is appearing in my class i have collected his mobile number and his email id in this way i have generated a list over last 10 years i have been teaching i have generated a huge list the total list came out to about 10000 okay this 10000 has people who have qualified the exam and also people who are pursuing the exam even now this huge list someone wanted to for me to share it i said this is my list i generated this list this is an internally generated intangible asset i cannot give you an access so is it identifiable yes can you control it yes it is within my control only. future economic benefits are probable yes because i will send a message saying that my videos are up for sale or my classes are up for sale economic benefits will generally flow in it is probable cost can be measured reliably yes or no no how can you measure a cost what is the cost which you have spent in generating that customer list in generating that student list since you cannot generate the cost i cannot recognize this technical know-how sir my enterprise can do this particular job in the fastest time possible because we have been doing it since long time we have certain techniques sir certain techniques are there fantastic techniques that they will speed up the process high efficiency is what we do recognize your technical know-how can you recognize it as an asset sir this man who is right sitting right beside me can write at what speed sir 100 marks of paper he can finish in two and a half hours ask him to recognize the intangible asset writing speed intangible asset future economic benefit probable yes i can complete entire 100 marks within three hours itself but can i measure them at cost cannot be measured at cost because the cost cannot be reliably measured therefore such internally generated assets cannot be recognized i can recognize an internally generated asset only to the extent of research and development cost which i will discuss later on clear as far as india's 40 is concerned if a person has acquired an asset under a finance lease then i will recognize as per india's 116 now it is no longer india's 17 india's 17 got replaced but india's 116 so according to india's 116 i will recognize the asset acquired either at its fair value or the present value of lease payments whichever is lower I will recognize the asset acquired at lower of fair value of the asset or present value of lease payments. Clear? This is the fundamental concepts regarding your measurement, initial measurement, which we discuss as a part of India 16, 38, as well as 40. We have seen five things: separate acquisition, multiple assets in single transaction, 
सेल्फ कंस्ट्रक्टेड एसेट गवर्नमेंट ग्रांट एंड एक्सचेंज ऑफ एसेट अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट वी हैव सीन टू पेक्यूलियर केसेस ऑफ इंडेज 38 रिगार्डिंग बिजनेस कॉम्बिनेशन एंड इंटरनली जनरेटेड एसेट एंड वन केस इन द केस ऑफ इंडेज 40 वेयर द एसेट वाज एक्वायर्ड अंडर फाइनेंस लीज सो दिस विल ब्रिंग अस टू द एंड ऑफ द कांसेप्ट रिगार्डिंग मेजरमेंट इनिशियल मेजरमेंट I am not talking about subsequent measurement yet. If you remember, we have seen initial measurement as at cost. So we are even now talking about how do I initially measure the asset. But when it comes to subsequent measurement, cost approach and revaluation approach have to be picked up. So here I will pause or we will stop. And we will look at the concept of subsequent measurement on a balance sheet date after this.